Warning, the following podcast contains percent symbols, asterisks, ampersands, and dollar signs. This week's episode of The Scathing Atheist is brought to you by ZipRecruiter and by Vulgarity for Charity 2019. Get your wallets out. It's time for sweet, sweet revenge. And now, The Scathing Atheist. Hi, this is Brian. And though I'm sure you've heard it before, the truth of the matter is, we did in fact evolve from filthy monkey men. Yeah, it's Thursday. It's October 31st. And there's nothing in the rule book that says you can't trick or treat when you're 30. You're 32. I'm no <laughs> illusions. I'm Eli Bosnick, still stands. I'm Ethan Wright. And from trick or treating Eli Bosnick's New Jersey, <laughs> Cincinnati Swing State, and Good Husband, Georgia, this is The Scathing Atheist. On this week's episode, we'll use our powers for good, like Monster Mama taught us. I'm Matt Gates, and I'm part of this intro. <laughs> <laughs> and Eli will reluctantly agree that it doesn't have to be the Vulgarity for Charity-tacular, since Vulgarity for Charity is already a name. We said we'd put a pin in it. <laughs> <laughs> but first, the diatribe. Gotta say, I'm pretty excited about Halloween this year. It's finally here. We've got our yard all decked out. We got the pumpkins carved. We got bucket loads of candy to give out. And I'm finally done putting all those little razor blades in them in my nefarious plot to murder random neighborhood children. Man, I sure hope their parents don't check the wrappers again this year, though, or I'll be foiled yet again. I mean, look, we're a pretty fucked up culture when it comes to holidays. You know, we celebrate a fictional resurrection by hiding eggs and we celebrate a gift giving holiday by forcing our children to sit on the lap of an overweight man earning minimum wage. But of all our holiday traditions, I'm pretty sure the weirdest is the annual candy checking ritual. Right. And, and maybe I'm just old and people don't do this anymore. Or maybe you're listening from a sane country and don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. So to be clear, I'm talking about the period after trick or treating is over when little Noah comes home freezing to death behind his toilet tissue, thick Kmart superhero costume weighed down with a pillowcase full of candy. But before he can eat any of it, mom and dad have to inspect it to make sure it hasn't been tampered with. And by tampered with, they mean had a razor blade inserted into it by a sociopathic neighbor who can't think of a less obvious or a less troublesome way to murder random children. And they were super clear on that. I, I'm, not, I'm just not sure why the supervillain wouldn't think to re-glue the package afterwards. But my parents were, or at least claimed to be, utterly convinced that A, there were people out there trying to booby trap my Halloween candy, and B, a cursory glance at the package would be enough to foil that homicidal plot. I honestly can't decide which of those is a weirder thing to believe. Of course, this was hardly idiosyncratic to my parents. Everybody's parents did this. They warned you about it in school. They had little public service announcements about it. Don't take Halloween candy that isn't wrapped. If some elderly lady took the time to make candied apples for every child in the neighborhood, it's safe to assume she poisoned them. Right. So don't take the chance. Stick with healthy standards like chocolate covered other chocolate and tubes of sugar that have been dyed blue. So it's a little less obvious that you're literally sucking down a tube of sugar. And to be honest, I don't know if society really believed all of that shit or if it was just one of those convenient lies to tell children like the tooth fairy or religion. It makes sense that my parents would want me to be scared as all hell to eat my candy while I was still out trick or treating. Right. Or, or maybe it was just so they could divide it up evenly between me and my siblings. Or maybe it was just a way for my dad to stash away a bunch of Snickers and Reese's cups before we'd done a count. But regardless of the reason, through ignorance or malice, my parents convinced me that there were people in the world cruel enough to stash razor blades in candy and that those people were so numerous that you had to operate as though there was one in every neighborhood. <laughs> I think about what a fucked up worldview that leaves kids with. Because I took that shit seriously. When I went door to door asking if I could rake leaves or shovel walks for a few bucks, I did so with a trepidation appropriate for a person who believes there was a good one in 30 chance that the person on the other side of the door was an elaborate psychopath, right? 
I, I, I would look at the candy in the store and I would think, hey, what's to stop the razor blade chocolatiers from branching out beyond Halloween? Is any candy safe? And why just candy? Couldn't one of them get a job at McDonald's and really speed this process up? And, and look, I know I just did a diatribe about irrational fear last week, but if there's ever a time of the year I can get away with back-to-back -back diatribes about fear, right? And, and I think it's important to draw a distinction here. It's bad to teach kids to be afraid of demons and ghosts and alien abduction. That can fuck them up something fierce. But you're on a whole new level when you start teaching them to fear each other. I mean, obviously, kids need some reasonable amount of fear there, right? Because there are bad people. You got to give them at least enough fear to stay out of the rapist's car, no matter how tasty that Kit Kat looks. But when you start inventing reasons, Right. Like you invent reasons for them to fear their neighbors. You've gone too goddamn far, no matter how convenient it is to have them unquestioningly turn over their candy for inspection at the end of Halloween. And in case it isn't already super obvious how this ties into the larger atheist theme of the show, let me spell it out for you. Children are taught to fear you. All over this fucking country, children are taught that your motivation and advocating for atheism, skepticism, evolution, geology, right? All of that is motivated by your desire to rend them from the arms of Christ. You're only pointing out the inconsistencies in the Bible and the immorality of God and Jesus because you want to rob them of eternal life and paradise. And what kind of fucking person would do that? Unless you think they soften this image by telling their kids that you're simply mistaken about religion, they supply you with a personal motivation. You're in love with sin. Right. You so enjoy your sinful ways that you're willing to abandon rational belief in God in an effort to justify him. You don't disagree with their assertions about God. You reject them and you do it all because you can't accept the charge to not be evil. The sole comfort is that we're not alone in our vilification. Right. We got the company of all the Muslims, all the Buddhists, the Hindus, the Jews, and probably the Mormons and Catholics. If we're being honest, everyone unlike them is to be feared. They're not just different. They're not just mistaken. They are sinister. And the only way they can stop being sinister is to start agreeing with you about religion. Look, it should go without saying that teaching your kid to fear an immortal fire satyr is a bad thing. It doesn't go without saying, but it should. The only comfort we can take is that there are no real fire satyrs that are going to be mistreated and prejudged if these kids ever happen across them. But you lose that defense when you start teaching your kids that the devil might just be their neighbor. They're talking about your Jesus. We interrupt this broadcast bring you a special news bulletin. Joining me for headlines tonight are the trick and treat to my fuck yeah, it's Halloween. Heath then writing to Eli Bosnick. Fellas, are you ready to lure neighborhood children in with candy? <laughs> I mean, I'd love to, but I usually just end up eating my own candy in a van by myself. That's sad. <laughs> so, Three I mean, words, gentlemen. Full-sized candy bars. Are you sure <laughs> on that count? I'm going to attack your house. <laughs> in our lead <laughs> story siege. tonight. At midnight tonight, the atheist community will remind the world once again that it's made up of the best fucking people our country has to offer when vulgarity for charity makes its triumphant return. That's right. Ooh. It is that time of year again. So from November 1st at midnight Eastern time, sure, why not, to November 27th, that's the day before Thanksgiving, you will have the chance to get in on the world's only tax-deductible insults. I mean, technically, donating to the Republican Party also counts, but our thing's better. Our thing is way, way better. <laughs> okay, but that's only tax deductible if it's a crisp. Never mind. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. Good try. <laughs> <laughs> so for those of you who are newer to the show, let me lay it down. Vulgarity for Charity is our annual joint charity drive with Tom and Cecil over at Cognitive Dissonance, wherein you, the altruistic listener, make a donation to our favorite charity, and we, the raunchy hosts, repay you by insulting any person, place, thing, concept, or phenomenon of your choosing. It can be your estranged uncle. It can be your boss, your friend, your congressman, or your least favorite brand of toothpaste. It doesn't matter. Between the three of us, there's nothing we can't insult. Damn right. We like to think of Heath as our puppy assassin, if you will. Uh, I am boycotting all dog roasting. That's <laughs> official. A line has to be drawn. That's ridiculous. <laughs> but your stupid fucking kid? Perfect. <laughs> your Republican uncle with face cancer? Even <laughs> more perfect. I don't know, Heath. Let Make me it check, happen. Well, let me check my notes here, Heath. Yeah, I still set up the roast, so your Fido-based adjectives better be ready. All right. Get ready for a really long silence boycott. I mean, whatever. 
That's what you're going to get. All right. So once again, it's this year we're raising money for Modest Needs. Uh, Modest Needs is a great charity. We've been working with them for years. They specialize in helping people that are just above the poverty line and are at risk of falling below it. Uh, these are people that don't qualify for a lot of traditional assistance, but are, like most of us, one unexpected expense away from a disaster. So last year, we raised over $130,000 thanks to an anonymous $50,000 match. And this year, that same anonymous donor is doubling their pledge. So we have a match for up to $100,000 this year, and we really want to max that out. And by the way, if you haven't checked out modestneeds.org to see like what that charity is, it is all the smart things you wish charities would do and 30 that you didn't think of. Yeah, it's it incre- really is. Yeah. They're fantastic. It yeah. really yes. is. All right, so here's how it works. You make a donation to Modest Needs of $50 or more. They'll email you a receipt. You forward that receipt to vulgarityforcharity at gmail.com. That's F-O-R, not the number four, along with the name of the person, place, or thing that you want us to insult and... Help us out here. If it's not a celebrity, if it's not a public figure, send along a picture with some details. Really hard for us if all we have to work with is the name Rick and the fact that he's an asshole. Then in the coming weeks or months, depending on how quick we can get to him, we'll be doing segments here and over on Cogdis where we're going to be verbally eviscerating our backlog. And lest Noah try to rush past it this year, if we hit our $100,000 goal, we will embark on our most requested fundraising goal Ever. No, absolutely. Cecil said no. And Sarah hit you with a bottle. Nonetheless, no. nonetheless, nonetheless. A- and then she hit you again with the broken bottle. She did. Are you fine. serious? Okay, fine. We'll do the most requested goal by people other than me. Uh, <laughs> if we can raise $100,000 and hit our match, Noah and Lucinda will quit smoking forever. What? You heard it. That's for real, by the way. That's not just Eli trying to set me up like last year. That's for real. <laughs> Lucinda's in on this. That's going to happen. So if we don't get to $100,000 and I die of cancer, it's your fault. Your fault. Uh, <laughs> you gave Noah cancer. <laughs> so be sure to check the show notes. We'll have links to more info about Modest Needs as well as a link to find more information about the fundraiser, too. Uh, we're shooting for the moon this year. We're going to need your help to get there. Also, the sooner you donate, the sooner you're going to hear your insult. So it's probably a good idea to act fast. Now. Do it now, please. Everyone else is going to wait. Do it now. <laughs> do it now. <laughs> and make that smoking thing happen. You'll get like a bonus, like a two-month Mickey and Mallory killing spree in South Georgia. Yeah, It'll be fucking right. No, small. we take out a ton of Republicans down here. <laughs> Start recording our business meetings. <laughs> Put that out as bonus content. Modest needs. Do it. And in OK, some church in the wild news tonight. <laughs> Kanye West has a mental <laughs> illness and a drug problem that has hurt his yeah. family, career and well-being. So you know what that means? He found Jesus. You're damn right. He did. Of course he did. It, it, well, no, and, and, and to be clear, that is not the mental illness or drug problem Eli was talking about, right? We, we I, would just, I want to be clear <laughs> that we would not denigrate mental illness or heroin by comparing them to religion. Yeah. <laughs> Mormonism is like heroin if your dealer would show up at your house and harass you after you quit trying to give you yeah, more right. shots. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that minus the euphoria part that well, you got yeah, to the have happiness at the beginning. Of yeah. The yeah. Heroin Heath, does, let me yeah. just say, you have never had a go-getter for a heroin dealer. Anyway... <laughs> What's the best way to show you've humbled yourself before our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? That's right. Releasing a Christian-themed IMAX film starring you about you and your new (laughs) album and your religion. (laughs) Yeah. And I watched the trailer for this thing. Based on the trailer, there's no reason for it to be an IMAX movie. No, there is not. Like, it's just Kanye walking and then camera shots of Kanye holding a camera and shots of a gospel choir that that's not also flying through New York like Spider-Man on strings and stuff. P- pretty sure Kanye just heard Max and wanted that. <laughs> yes. So he was like, yeah, I want an IMAX movie. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. So uh, according to the man who's been calling himself Jesus for the last few years, he's found God and will no longer make secular music. Now, we should point out that Yeezy's Christianity has taken even weirder forms than an 
IMAX film dedicated to himself. According to many sources, he now insists that his collaborators on tracks read the Bible and demands they remain celibate while they work together. Oh, cool. Yeah, works great for the Vatican with yeah, the priests. No, yeah, really what could has. possibly go wrong with that? Yeah. He has also publicly policed his wife Kim Kardashian's fashion choices. On a recent episode of Keeping Up with the Kardashians, a show you should watch for the same reason you should know why Rome fell. Uh, why, did, why did Rome fall, Eli? Hats. He expressed his displeasure <laughs> at her outfit for the Met Gala, saying, quote, I went through this transition where being a rapper, looking at these girls and looking at my wife like, oh, my girl needs to be just like the other girls showing their body off. I didn't realize that was affecting my soul and my spirit. As someone who is married and the father of now about to be four kids, a corset is a form of underwear. It's hot. For who, though? End quote. To which Kim replied, you're giving me really bad anxiety. You knew last night I had really bad anxiety and I don't need any more negative energy. And for you to say you're now not into me wearing a tight dress. End quote. <laughs> it's fine, though. Kanye balanced it out by dressing like an undercover Republican for that event. So. <laughs> he did, yeah. So silly looking with like big track big sneakers. Yep. <laughs> All black track suit, yeah. Side note, the Patreon goal for those wondering for me to start a new podcast where I read the transcripts of Keeping Up With The Kardashians is $1. One and, and dollar. <laughs> quick, before you hit that goal, I want to reiterate that no using the but it's audio excuse to do blackface is still on the whiteboard. I haven't yeah. moved it. Mm. Yeah, it's weird that me and the Prime Minister of Canada share a whiteboard. <laughs> <laughs> if only he had waited until audio only mediums. <laughs> and finally, we should point out that this is not the first time that Yeezy has tried to cash in on Jesus. In the words of the website hotnewhiphop.com, quote, We wish Ye the best on his mission, but it wouldn't be the first time he publicly expressed a thought on a whim that never ended up manifesting. Kanye also claimed The Life of Pablo was a gospel album, which featured hip-hop production and wildly raunchy lyrics. So his understanding of religious music might be quite broad. And <laughs> what? <laughs> well, that's the first and last time anybody's ever suggested Kanye's understanding of a thing was broad. So we're going to pause <laughs> on that rare alignment and hand things over to my lovely wife, Lucinda. A man wrote the Bible. A whore is what she was. If it's a legitimate rape. If it's a slut, right? It, cooking can be fun. Hey, I'm proud of a man. This week in Misogyny. So the setting is the Truth Matters Conference, an evangelical conference dedicated to lying. The theme is the sufficiency of scripture, or why none of the other books count. And the speaker was John MacArthur, pastor and longtime host of the Grace to You radio show. So, you know, we're about to get some crazy progressive thoughts on the role of women in society, right? So during a panel, the moderator decides to play a fun word association game and calls on everybody to respond to various subjects in two words. John MacArthur's subject was Beth Moore. And obviously, if you or I got that subject, our two word reply would be the fuck's that. But a guy like John MacArthur knows exactly who the moderator was asking about. She's the founder of Living Proof Ministries, which is a ministry that focuses on aiding women. And nothing pisses evangelical men off like aiding women. So his two-word response was, go home. The audience clapped because what kind of awful fucks would pay to go to something like this to begin with? But to make it clear that he wasn't just disparaging her as a human being, he went on to complain that, quote, the church is caving in to women preachers, end quote, before launching into a tirade about the evils of the Me Too movement. So, yeah, his argument is that evangelical Christians, i.e. the people currently in your audience cheering wildly at every misogynistic brain turd you utter, are getting too feminist. But enough bad news. Let's move on to some good news I missed at the beginning of the month. Northern Ireland is set to move into last century with its abortion laws now that their high court has ruled that their current laws contravene UK human rights laws. This ruling stemmed from a case where a woman in Northern Ireland was being denied an abortion even after multiple doctors concluded that her fetus wasn't viable. So she had to go to London to terminate her pregnancy. A quick jaunt of 500 miles and the IRC. So to be clear, they're not exactly going to become civilized or anything. Their current law allows for abortion only when there's a serious risk to the women's physical or mental health. And apparently they don't consider being forced to bear the child of rape to be a risk to her mental health nor are cases where the baby will die shortly after birth. 
it's very important to pro-life people that those babies suffer, you see. And as bad as all of that is, the only thing set to change is that last one. So no soup for Ireland, but they're at least allowed to smell other people's soup now. And lastly, I want to thank Lucas Gauthier, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, and his friend Annie, who made my week by trolling the shit out of Kevin Sorbo. See, K Sorbs has this thing where you can pay him 50 bucks and he'll record a happy birthday message or a congratulations or whatever the fuck you want him to say. He needs the money. So Lucas gave him 50 bucks and asked him to congratulate Annie on her recent abortion. In the message, he said, quote, it was the abortion we had together. It was my baby. We are both very excited that it got sucked out a science tube, end quote. Well, in order to turn the money down on principle, you'd have to have principles. So k Sorbs took their money and sent them this preachy video about the horrors of abortion, which included the line, quote, if this is funny for you guys, whatever. Kind of a sick way to be funny, but it does make me sad. It does, end quote. And don't get me wrong. It is funny. It's fucking hilarious. But even if it wasn't, I'm pretty sure the fact that you're sad made it worth Lucas's 50 bucks because you're not just the butt of the joke. You're also a horrible, terrible person. And on that note, I'll hand things back over to Noah, Heath, and Eli. Thank you, Lucinda. And in Toucan Sam Wants You news tonight, Tony the Tiger, <laughs> Toucan Sam, and Snap, Crackle, and Pop are among the most beloved corporate mascots in American history, and it would be impossible for any sane person to get furious over any story that involves all of them. So you know what that means, Anna? What are the guys talking about? It's the newest, the greatest Christian freakout. That's right. Kellogg's recently announced a promotion in which six of their most popular cereals will be sold together in the same box in support of anti-bullying advocacy. The combined monstrosity is called All Together Cereal and contains looks so good. Frosted so Flakes, good. Horrifying. Rice Krispies, Corn Flakes, Raisin Bran, Fruit Loops, and Frosted Mini Wheats. That's fantastic. You guys wouldn't no, want that? Isn't. Are you serious? No, it's fucking oh my insane. God. You add Reese's Cups and Glenlivet Pods and non-dairy creamer, and that's the official Heath Trail Mix that I make <laughs> when I hike. <hide. laughs> Oh, that's going out in the swag bags for the high level. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that is going now, out. <laughs> of course, uh, Christians are losing their shit, and not in the literal way one would normally associate with eating cornflakes, raisin bran, and frosted mini wheats at the same time. <laughs> Instead, <laughs> they're losing their shit because anti-bullying shares a lot of Venn diagram space with anti-Christian, you see. Uh, along with pro-14th Amendment. So, yeah, not a great sign when you're threatened by the Equal Protection Clause. Yeah, right. And cereal. <laughs> yeah, none of these okay. snacks. Yeah. We are all threatened by this cereal heat. Seriously, <laughs> who are you talking about? That's amazing. Did they make this because putting your mouth in a paper shredder was too expensive? Yeah, so There's no Captain Crunch in there. That's Quaker. <laughs> Suck Kellogg's. All right, so this whole promotion is in support of uh, Spirit Day a nearly decade-long annual LGBTQ Awareness Day, and Kellogg's promotion came along with a $50,000 donation to GLAAD, the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation. Christians, though, are big fans of defaming gays and lesbians, so they spoke out. The Orders of Magnitude Impaired One Million Moms was among the first to launch this protest <laughs> against serial miscegenation, <laughs> releasing a statement that read in There's part, like six of them. quote, <laughs> Kellogg's has supported the homosexual community for a long time, and now it's obvious they? they are going after our children, end quote, because what? until now, One Million Moms wasn't super sure which demographic Kellogg's had been aiming at. <laughs> uh, let me tell you, the wrong one, okay? Because I promise you I buy more Raisin Bran than any of those brats could dream of. <laughs> dream of. Just saying. Well, even if Kellogg's stops making this amazing, I will repeat that amazing combo mix, <laughs> this is a great little addition to the Satanic Temple milk pouring demonstration that they okay, like yeah. to do. Also, I really want to watch these bigots to see where they draw the line. I want to do a little experiment. Like, like I put a frosted flake next to a fruit loop and they start trembling a little. And then I slide <laughs> a little closer. I start yelling and barking. I throw a rice crispy in there. They start having gay sex. I don't know. Like, what happens? I mean, we went to Utah. There is a correlation. I'm not saying yes, there's a causation. No, you're right. <laughs> 
Of course, uh, landlocked stationary boat owner Ken Ham also needed to get in on the action, tweeting out a picture of the new cereal with a comment that read, quote, we are not all together as the LGBT <laughs> as the LGBTQ lifestyle slash worldview is anti-God, anti-biblical and anti-science no. and consists of only a small minority in the culture. So much there. Just so goddamn <laughs> much there. But he continues, but many will all together not support such a in your face anti Christian marketing, end quote. Because Ken Ham apparently forgot that he's still supposed to pretend that bully and Christian aren't synonyms. Yep. Ugh. Gross. But the cereal is amazing one more time. No. And finally tonight. You don't like those what are they one more time? Fruit I'm Loops back. and Raisin Bran together? Are you fucking You're kidding me? They're both delicious. Raisin and fake fruit. No, and then there's a fucking <laughs> frosted yeah. flake in there too. The raisins some, aren't even the raisins are just covered in sugar too. They fit great with the Fruit Loop sugar. It's just all you can sugar. pour that glucose test liquid over the top. It'll be fucking great. We are in a fight. And <laughs> finally tonight. We have a story out of Australia about a so-called rain salesman. So let's go ahead and start by saying, don't buy rain from rain salesmen. That's not a thing. <laughs> no, we could even go, don't buy rain, I think. Yeah, yeah don't okay. buy water. <laughs> Too far. No, nope. buy yeah, water. Okay. Sorry. I, nope, I got caught up. Yeah. Just, <laughs> it's bad for you. now. Unfortunately, this a priori knowledge didn't quite make it to all the farmers in Australia yet. In the Melbourne, sorry, in the Melbourne area, they're actually dealing with <laughs> one of the worst droughts in recent memory. And a number of these farmers have been successfully sold on a weather modification service for the price of $50,000. <laughs> they just got a dedicated team of guys scaring Chinese butterflies. Yeah. <laughs> Those guys, Mark Wahlberg. <laughs> <laughs> So the uh, con man behind the rainmaker is David Miles, who happens to look like Jim Gaffigan, became an incel and purchased about a dozen extra bottom teeth. So so Jim Gaffigan with extra teeth. There you go. And that should have been your first red flag. The second red flag should have been the moment when he said, I invented a machine that controls the weather. Yep. And the third red flag should have been the use of the phrase electromagnetic scalar waves <laughs> on the company website, <laughs> along with the following description of the Rainmaker technology. Quote, we use current meteorological modeling of near future atmospheric behavior produced by Bureau Supercomputing in order to ascertain the vulnerable, sensitive dependencies of converging events. End quote. All right. Feel free to check my math on this, but I'm pretty sure that translates to I watch the weather forecast. It sure weather does. Forecast. No, it sure yeah, does. Okay. Yep. Yep. Correct. Right. <laughs> Just want to make sure. <laughs> and one final enormous red flag should have been the sales pitch that said, you only have to pay for the rainmaker if it rains. So, oh wow! So, so if it never rains in the future, you get it for free. Man, that when the future ends, that guy's gonna lose his shirt. <laughs> Big <guess>. trouble. <laughs> so yeah, it's weird that farmers in that area didn't ask around to a few of their neighbors about sharing the bill for fifty grand, or or maybe <laughs> the rainmaker device has a setting for specific pieces of property. <laughs> it's it's not clear how that works. Regardless, this whole story. Perfectly illustrates why organized religion is literally fraudulent and why its leaders should get prosecuted for fraud because they commit fraud. The business model is exactly identical to the idea of giving time and money to a church in advance for the possible future reward of heaven. Well, except that rain exists. Yeah. Well, yeah. besides the existence part. So there's that. <laughs> but don't worry, if you die and go to hell, you can ask for your money back. So it's, yeah, yeah, it's fine. Right. There. Uh, and, and now there's a bunch of new websites I have to forbid Eli from buying. So we're going to close the headlines there. Heath, Eli, <laughs> thanks as always. I can fuck you to purgatory.com. And when we come back, we'll finally learn who to send the ransom notes to for all those words we stole. I can, though. <laughs>
Hiring can be a slow process. Cafe Altura's COO Dylan Miskowitz needed to hire a director of coffee for his organic coffee company, but he was having trouble finding qualified applicants. So he switched to ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter doesn't depend on candidates finding you. It finds them for you. Its technology identifies people with the right experience and invites them to apply to your job so you get qualified candidates fast. Dylan posted his job on ZipRecruiter and said he was impressed by how quickly he had great candidates apply. He also used ZipRecruiter's candidate rating feature to filter his applicants so he could focus on the most relevant ones. And that's how Dylan found his new director of coffee in just a few days. With results like that, it's no wonder that four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. See why ZipRecruiter is effective for businesses of all sizes. Try ZipRecruiter for free at our web address, ZipRecruiter.com slash scathing. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash S-C-A-T-H-I-N-G, ZipRecruiter.com slash scathing. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. When we first started this show, we dedicated ourselves to rebutting the very best apologetics that Christianity had to offer. So we scoured the literature for the brightest minds and most well-formed arguments and then dutifully disassembled them. But along the way, we noticed that most Christians don't actually know the best apologetics, and often they don't even understand them well enough to realize that they're refuted. So to make sure we've done the job thoroughly, we're also now taking on the very worst in Christian apologetics, as represented by Hillary Morgan Ferrer's (laughs) Mama Bear Apologetics. So quick recap. So far, this book has been about why you should buy this book. And last month, we learned that it's not enough to tell your kids what to think. You've got to tell them how to think. And also, we learned that Hillary Morgan Ferrer is pretty sure she was one Christian summer camp visit away from going ass to ass with Jennifer Connelly. Yes. Yes, we did is. learn that. <laughs> we did learn that. Yeah. So uh, that brings us to chapter four, linguistic theft. Huh. Redefining words to get your way and avoid reality. That is a surprisingly honest chapter. Now. <laughs> yes. Sadly, no. She is uh she's talking about us, not her. Uh of course she is. Sorry. Yes. Withdrawn. <laughs> so her first example of linguistic theft is the word gay. Specifically, the time she walked down the halls of fifth grade screaming, I feel so gay. She everything comes back to hmm. going ass to ass with Jennifer Connolly with this woman. <laughs> <laughs> right. So here's her quote on opening up on linguistic theft. Quote. Linguistic theft is much more sinister than just the evolution of language. Linguistic theft refers to purposefully hijacking words, changing their definitions, and then using those same words as tools of propaganda, end quote. So Christian persecution, religious freedom, (laughs) that kind of thing. (laughs) Exactly. Science, evidence, space time, counting numbers, pi, bats, birds. Yeah. Foot penis. There's a lot. <laughs> Sorry, wait, 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 wait. Foot penis? You really should read ahead. You yeah, I read ahead. Should read I, ahead. Sh- <laughs> I should read ahead. There you go. Well, foot means penis in the Bible. <laughs> All right. right. Well, luckily for us, Sometimes. Hillary actually has a list of words that are currently being stolen, and she's going to break down the true meanings of some of those later. But those words are marriage, love, hate, equality, justice, Male, female, tolerance, Ugh. bigotry, oppression, really? war, and crisis. God, I'm surprised she <laughs> didn't include there. I'm sure it was in a draft. <laughs> it was in a draft. Right. So now that she's established there's a war on the definition of the word war, it's time for a <laughs> section titled, Who Cares About Words? Words are just social construct, right? I just love her fucking <laughs> audience is so dumb that she has to actually have a chapter called Who Cares About Words? <laughs> words are a Ponzi scheme. Just fucking random shapes and face noises. <laughs> blue, blah, blee, blee, blue. End of book. Can we just end the book now? <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's how it would go if I had written it. But for HMO, she wants us to know that words are super important. So are you guys ready to get your minds blown? Oh, yeah. All right. Words are so important that even... I didn't say I was ready. Okay. Take a time. Ready? Three, two, one. Words are so important (laughs) that even Jesus was words. What? Yeah. What? Because in John 1, the Bible says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. 
And bird is the word. So God <laughs> is a bird and God is everything. So bats are birds, checkmate. Atheist, so all makes fucking sense. Sam, QED, motherfucker. We, we got got. So now it's time for Hillary to show her hand a bit. Here's what she has to say. Quote, what will our kids do when taking a stand against sin is interpreted as oppressive? According to the new definition to defend the oppressed now requires affirming sin, end quote. And I really, really want to know what HMO thinks the original definition of defending <laughs> yeah. the oppressed is. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. For the record, lady, that is exactly word for word the same argument the antebellum south used against emancipation right i, I just yep. i would love it if you guys would refresh your arguments every civil war or so <laughs> <laughs> i bet she was team iron man too gross okay <laughs> heath we do not speak of the dead like that so, <laughs> we do not let it go so with that out of the way it's time for a section called how linguistic theft works. And ironically, this section is basically a how-to guide disguised <laughs> yes. as a preventative one. Yeah, this book is basically a for-profit linguistic prison. Right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and by the way, yes, Hillary, you can use that quote on the book jacket if you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> right, so she's going to break down the bad things about linguistic theft into several subsections because... We did something terrible in a past life, and this segment is our punishment. But basically, the intro here is, you might think it's all fun and games to disagree about what words mean, but linguistic theft has some real consequences, y'all. Yeah, it's called the Republican Party of the modern day. Yeah. The Party of Christ. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Frank Luntz. Thanks, buddy. <laughs> so <laughs> Hillary's first problem with linguistic theft is that it stops a discussion in its tracks. Also, she concludes this subsection by saying, quote, fake definitions obscure the issues. And it doesn't make sense to attempt to carry on a discussion when we're working with two different meanings of the same word. End quote. Got it. Cool. Uh, I just want to add one other thing. Biweekly. Great. Can we stop talking about this book now? Are we done? <laughs> OK, so now it's time for subsection two. Linguistic theft compels people to act without thinking through the issues. Yeah, hell, you can get all the way to the end of your manuscript and then go, fuck, mother means a person with children, doesn't it? Damn it. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> You'd think. You'd think. So now it's time for HMO to prove that either she hasn't seen Star Wars or she doesn't understand. Star anyway, she's got an awesome example. Here you go. Ready? Quote, picture that scene in Star Wars Episode 4 when Obi-Wan <laughs> Kenobi... Use the force to get out of a sticky situation. Sorry, who calls it Star Wars Episode Four? Right, someone who has you, never it's Star seen Wars it. <laughs> or A New Hope, maybe. No, it's just Star Wars. <laughs> yeah, Star, Star Wars Episode Four of five, six, S nine, many Star Wars. If yeah, she <laughs> continues. He could have said, "Are you profiling?" I'm so offended. Do you know how racist you sound right now? How would you feel if it was your droid being stopped at every turn? Stop oppressing these droids. They are not the droids you're looking for, you intolerant bigot. That's probably how the script would read nowadays, end quote. Wait, but the droids are oppressed. Like, like, like <laughs> the next scene in the movie yeah. Is the one where they're denied entry to the cantina because the bartender, quote, doesn't serve their kind, right? <laughs> like, was she just so into justifying bigotry that she started using all the fictional bigotry, too? <laughs> Why is. don't they have fucking stars upon theirs, all right? Get some fucking stars. <laughs> and now that we're on the subject, Bob Ewell was a victim of PC culture gone too far. <laughs> yeah. Trial in the public eye. Thank you. <laughs> but it actually gets worse. See, as we learn in subsection for linguistic theft, it also vilifies the opposing viewpoint. Yeah. You know, like when you accuse people who disagree with you of being inhabited by a goat demon. Right. Top my head. Or, or when you refer to clarification as linguistic theft. <laughs> yeah, right. People being smarter than me is intellectual theft. <laughs> what? <laughs> Stole my brain and thonins. <laughs> so don't worry. Hill Dog has some more examples for us. See if you can find the opinion that doesn't belong in this quote. All right, ready? Not many people will stand on a street corner with a sign that says, 
everyone should be able to have sex with whomever they want, no matter the gender, age, relation, or Found number it. of participants. Hey, phone too. Think about it. <laughs> However, you will see signs that say love is love, end quote. Yes, yes, the classic, then how come I can't fuck my nine-year-old nephew defense? Keep it classy, Hill. <laughs> Keep it classy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, she's God. got another example, which is truly my favorite, if only because of the citation. Quote, or how about anti-free speech rallies that equate free speech with fascism? You may think I'm kidding, but on many college campuses, advocating for free speech will get you branded as a fascist. End quote. And her footnote here is truly one of the silliest articles I've ever read. It's by The Hill, and it's about Antifa, and it all but accuses them of stealing the socks people lose in the dryer. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, Antifa should start doing that. It's an amazing, yeah. amazing form of protest. Yeah. But we have one more glorious example of linguistic theft here. Hitler. God, this book literally has a Godwin count. It does. It does. So wow. far, it is 100%. So here's the quote. And don't forget about Hitler. Oh, Hitler. He's the kid nobody what? wants on their kickball team. What? Um, That's a bad description of Hitler. I'm going to say that's a bad way yeah. to describe Adolf Hitler. Yeah. She continues, the Christians claim he was atheist. Atheists claim he was a Christian. The right says he was left. The left says he was right. If your camp can make the opposing camp share anything in common with Hitler, then you have won hands down. End quote. Well, okay. All right. Whoa, whoa. One side is right on both of those opposing <laughs> views you. points, though. <laughs> Right wing <laughs> Christian, right? Like, you might as well be like, well, you'll hear up is up, up is down, east is east, east is west. Who knows what to believe anymore? <laughs> three equals three, three equals 3.14, 4.6 billion equals 6,000. No, it doesn't. It's mathematical. <laughs> no, what do you believe? Oh, that brings us to our final subsection. Linguistic theft turns a negative into a positive. And according to Hillary, quote, You'll see this happen, especially during pro-life slash pro-choice debates. What exactly do those who are pro-choice mean by choice? If they want to get technical, they are referring to the choice for a woman to scald, dismember, or suction her in utero fetal human if she no longer wants to grow it in her body. End quote in a chapter dedicated to to accusing other people of linguistic theft. Uh, and, and immediately following wow. the be respectful of everybody's <laughs> ideas thing. Now, unfortunately, she couldn't finish the chapter the way she wanted to because her pro-life club was scheduled to celebrate an execution later that day after yeah. they <laughs> protested against closing the gun show loophole. So it was a whole big thing. <sighs> yeah. Yeah. I'm just going to go tie this tube sock to a cinder block and throw it in the river. I'll be back in a second. <laughs> gotta, gotta get the evidence. I get it. So, as promised, now it's time for a list of words, words that, that are, are being, being stolen. stolen. Alright, you ready? First up? No. Love. So, Hillary gets out her dictionary to fill her word count, but this is her point. Quote, Today, to love someone means to blindly accept whatever that person believes, even if his or her belief contradicts reality end quote so faith <laughs> god is love is faith that is dumb hillary morgan Ferrer. good point that's dumb <laughs> right but of course the truth is god is love wow uh i'm just gonna let her do the work for me from now on yeah. She's yep. gonna go <laughs> <laughs> that isn't at all confusing by the way in case you were thinking that was confusing because when you know that god rejoices in the truth and speaking of which, guess what? The next word that's being stolen is truth. So according to HMO, quote, our kids are now encouraged to live their truth. This is my truth. He's being authentic to his truth. I can't begin to tell you how dangerous this one lie is. When society messes with the definition of truth, it's messing with our kids' very foundation of reality, end quote. And she concludes, quote, even science is ignored if it contradicts the paradigm of tolerance, end quote. Yeah, nobody cares about the integrity of science like a Christian apologist writing a book. <laughs> yep. What? And that brings her to her next stolen word, tolerance. So according to Hillary, quote, 
The word tolerance no longer means to live peacefully with people of different beliefs. It now means that all beliefs, no matter how bogus, must be treated as equally legitimate, end quote. Nope. And, and then I got sad because McKindle told me that 63 other people highlighted that sentence in the book. And I bet only a couple of them did it ironically. <laughs> well, but okay, but <laughs> therein lies the fucking deception or linguistic theft, if you will. Tolerance means that the people have to be treated as legitimate, not their beliefs. Nobody is arguing that I should have to take your dumbass Jesus shit seriously. But if I tried to pass a law that says, you know, for example, you're not allowed to buy cake because you're a Christian, I would then be <laughs> yeah. crossing the fucking line. <laughs> The difference. You got to keep it on the inside, HMO. It's on the inside. But don't worry. She actually has a, a scientific citation here. It's a YouTube video <laughs> by the Family Policy Institute of Washington called Gender Identity. Can a 5'9 white guy be a 6'5 Chinese woman? Oh, fuck you. <laughs> well, maybe with a note from Donald Trump's doctor. <laughs> Partway there. Yeah. So uh, that brings us to our next stolen words. Justice and equality. And here, Hillary points out that every whiner who wants a leg up is asking for justice these days. Am I right? Here are her examples. Gay marriage, the women's march again, and wealth disparity. Yeah, also fuck poor people. Yep, she works yeah. that in there. Poor people, gross. They can't even afford a kickball to play with Hitler. It's not even <laughs> worth discussing. <laughs> but don't worry, because you know who does know about justice the Old Testament. What? Here's the quote. Really? Yeah. In today's culture, justice no longer means what is merited. When someone talks about equality, they are no longer referring to equality of access or worth. They mean equality of outcome. End quote. If equality of outcome is heavily racist, then either equality of opportunity is racist or Hillary Morgan Ferrer would like to rank the races unironically. There you Those go. Yes. yes, right, right. She's the most maligned intellectual of her time. So she closes her justice and equality section by talking about how they don't let Asians into Harvard anymore because of affirmative action. <laughs> <laughs> that must have been an interesting afternoon of data gathering by Hillary Morgan Ferrer. Just going up to people in Harvard Yard. Hello, uh, are you Chinese? No, that's what I thought. No Asians. I knew it. No Asians. <laughs> and hey, speaking of that, you know what other word has been stolen? Bigot. And again, she's going to hit us with the paradox of tolerance by saying, quote, the irony is that people who use the term bigot in this manner are actually living out the very definition of the word. According to Merriam Webster's dictionary, a bigot is, quote, a person who is obstinately or intolerantly devoted to his or her own opinions and prejudices and where she ends the quote. Yeah, yeah, right. No, no, thank you. This one pissed me off quite a bit. There is another sentence in that definition, right? She intentionally left off the second half of the Merriam-Webster dictionary definition, which continues, quote, especially one who regards or treats the members of a group such as racial or ethnic group with hatred or intolerance, end quote. <laughs> So that was convenient. Yeah, no, she literally truncated the dictionary definition to intentionally obscure the meaning of the word in a chapter about how bad it is to re <laughs> redefine fucking words. If you need me, I'll be propelling myself backwards across the Atlantic in a rolly chair with the power of my screams. <laughs> yeah, I'll race you. I will race you. <laughs> and our final stolen word is authentic. Please be talking about the Dead Sea Scrolls. Please be talking about the no. Dead Sea Scrolls. What? Sadly, she leaves Come the on. whole Hobby Lobby Museum out of this section. It's very sad. <laughs> no, this section is terrifyingly about the ungodly act of accepting that you aren't perfect. What? Right. So what she's going for here is that the only reason people should admit that they have flaws is so they can compare themselves to Jesus and repent. And all the people in Christianity who tell you to, like, learn to love yourself and your beautiful, messy life are actually telling you sin is OK or something. I actually don't understand this section. I think she's mad because her friend got like a bless this mess wooden board from Pier One and she didn't let her burn it. I don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, Hillary, if it's any consolation, when we all say you're fine just the way you are, we're not talking about you. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
And we're lying to whoever we're talking that, to. That, also. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So now we know that the Jews have derailed the word bigot from its original meaning of not being nice to assholes. It's time to learn how <laughs> to fight back without being a jerk. Um, too late. Yes, <laughs> too late. Uh, too so late. First up on how not to be a jerk. Know the biblical definition of those words. <laughs> yeah, and then wait for Noah to go on a call-in show. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> now we know what book that dude was reading. So, <laughs> so she's going to give away the game here in the first sentence of how not to be a jerk when she says, and I swear this is a real quote, you might want to find a dictionary from before 1950 and look at some of the definitions before agendas started creeping in. Oh. End quote. She continues, really, if the word isn't in the Bible, like bigot, then study how that word is defined and talk about examples of actual bigotry. Ahem, 1960s desegregation much? End quote. <laughs> Definitions of bigot and jerk got all fucked up after Brown v. The Board of Education in 54. <laughs> yeah, you gotta go. Right. Are you fucking serious? I, she <laughs> is. Okay. How not to be a jerk on her list number two. Teach your kids to identify buzzwords, you know, because nothing says honest debate like dismissing people based on words you've decided aren't real. A and her example here is the word deserve. She says, if you see an ad that says you deserve something, you should ask your kids, quote, what if a person gives wedgies to handicapped kids? Do you think he or she deserves a new X, Y, Z then? What does the Bible say about what we deserve? Hint. Romans 6.23, end quote. And in case you don't want to look it up, that's the wages of sin is death passage. Yep. Right? Yes, it is. She's literally suggesting to teach your kids that what they deserve is to die. <laughs> yeah, that easy bake oven does look pretty cool. Have I mentioned God is going to kill you because a lady ate an apple? <laughs> Why are you crying? Why are you crying? <laughs> Precisely. Next up, number three, identify when you are embarrassed to state your position. And this entire number is, look, if everyone in culture has told you your opinion is so abhorrent that your own revulsion kicks in at your thoughts and feelings, lean into that thought and feeling and feel it double. <laughs> yeah, right. No, like basically, if you look back and see that there is indeed an African-American gentleman behind you, Weigh his feelings against how funny the joke is. <laughs> Jesus. And against how unfair it is that you had to use blackface to get into Harvard. That's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> and then tell an Asian joke because they don't exist there. Yeah, yeah, right. you'll be banned. <laughs> and finally, on our list of how not to be a jerk is decide to be salt and light. What? It's basically Bruce. where she's saying, if you're like salt in an open wound, keep it up. Just don't miscegenate with pepper. What the fuck does that mean? <laughs> yeah, I have no idea. I think it means that like hurting people is fine, but that didn't make the word count. Anyways, it's time for the discussion questions. Gentlemen, are you ready for the discussion questions? I think I am, sir. <sighs> One icebreaker. Give an example of a word that people use incorrectly. What bothers you about this usage, and how can you communicate the right meaning of the word? Ooh, ooh I have a perfect word for this one. Mama. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to go with ironic. For example, it's not ironic that a Christian apologetics book tried to redefine bigot during its chapter about linguistic theft, because that's exactly what you should expect from a Christian apologetics <laughs> book. Yeah, there you go. True that. Uh, number two. Main theme, people change word definitions to make their agendas sound more appealing or to hide their true motives. How have you seen this strategy at work in our culture and affecting it? Oh, oh, uh, one time I saw a lady dress up. When your kids say they deserve a PS5, you tell them they deserve to rot in hell with a wedgie joke. Oh, one time. <laughs> I once saw a book try to hide the Christian element of the Holocaust by focusing on Hitler's kickball ability. <laughs> um <laughs> And then just lying. Then just right lying. lying. Yeah. Just just straight up lying. Chapter. Yeah. All right. Number three, self-evaluation. Have you caught yourself inadvertently adopting culture's new definitions? If so, which ones? What made it hard to discern the agenda behind the way those words were being used? 
I'm going to go with a no on this one. I use the common definitions of words very advertently. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I reject the question in which Hillary Morgan Ferrer is very clearly saying it's actually more racist that white people can't use the N-word anymore, if you think about <laughs> yes, it. Like, it's just, that's just as racist as anything else. <laughs> All right, number four, brainstorm. What are some ways you can start teaching your kids about the real and biblical definitions of love, truth, tolerance, justice, equality, bigotry, and authenticity? If you're in a group, have everyone pick a word and study it this week. Come back next week and share what the Bible says about that word or concept and how it differs from what culture says. Well, uh, I'm good at following instructions, so I'm going to answer that one next week. But I do appreciate that she admits <laughs> that you should teach your children both the real and biblical definitions, though. Yeah, you want them both in there. Yeah, I'll participate in this one, too. I'll head over to Covington Catholic and teach them about some words. That should go great. I'll <laughs> let you know how that all turns out. All right. And finally, release the bear. Listen closely to your kids' conversations this week, Normal. What <laughs> words have they absorbed from the culture that need to be corrected? If you hear them using a linguistically hijacked word, set aside time to talk about it. Ask, <laughs> what do you think that word means? Make sure your children know the real definition. You would be amazed at how adopting a correct definition changes someone's perspective. How could a, a word be hijacked in a way that's not linguistically? I wonder <laughs> what she thinks that means. Yeah. But uh, I'm worried I might venture into crime think territory if I, if I deal with this question. I'm going to yeah. play it safe and skip this one. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll tell you what. At least this book has given us permission to keep rubbing salt in it. So we're going to be back next month with even more Mama Bear Apologetics. Before we sign out and quit tonight, I want to remind you that Vulgarity for Charity starts at midnight tonight. And I'll tell you what, if you donate a day early, we'll count that. So just go to modestneeds.com, donate $50 or more, email us the receipt at vulgarityforcharity.com. That's the word for, not the number, with the information on who or what you want insulted. We will do the rest. And if you can't donate 50, donate what you can, send us the stuff anyway, and we might just include your insult as well. Every dollar you donate is worth double. So help us squeeze every penny out of that $100,000 match and help remind the world that atheists are among the most charitable, thoughtful, caring, and altruistic people in the world. Anyway, that's all the blasphemy we've got for you tonight, but we'll be back in 10,022 minutes with more. If you can't wait that long, be on the lookout for a brand new episode of our sister show's Hot Friend God Awful Movies, debuting at 7 a.m. Eastern on Tuesday, and an even new episode of our half-sister show, Citation Needed, debuting at noon Eastern on Wednesday. Obviously, I'd be demoted to co-host if I neglected to thank Keith Enright for battling through a literal three-degree internal temperature to be with us today. I need to thank Eli Bosnick for also being pretty hot, and I also want to thank the lovely and talented Lucinda Lusions for raising my internal temperature every time I see her. I also want to thank Brian for providing this week's Farnsworth quote. He probably has an enormous penis if you think about it. But most of all, of course, I want to thank this week's best people, Chris, Glenn, Oliver, Joshua, Connor, Eric with a K, Natalie, Zig Smash, Ben, Seth, Jim, Eric with a C, Philip, Pink Gloom, Ben, Cass, Bryson, and Naxamander. Chris, Glenn, Oliver, Joshua, Connor, and Eric with a K, whose dicks have to be continued, tattooed halfway down the shaft. Natalie, Zig Smash, Ben, Seth, Jim, and Eric with a C, whose neurotransmitters leave skid marks when they think. And Philip, Pink Gloom, Ben, Cass, Bryson, and Naxamander, who are so bright, eclipse glasses warn their kids not to look directly into them. Together, these 18 apex atheists aided our alienation of the Abrahamic amorality this week by giving us money. Not everybody has the keen detection skills it takes to give us money, but if you're up to the challenge, you can make a per episode donation at patreon.com slash scathing atheist, whereby you'll earn early access to an extended ad free version of every episode, or you can make a one time donation by clicking on the donate button on the right side of the homepage at scathingatheist.com. And if you'd like to help, but your creditors won't take dick jokes in lieu of payment, you can also help a ton by giving us a five star review, telling a friend about the show, and following at PIATPod on Twitter. The legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres, Tim Robinson, Hales, or social media and our audio engineer is Morgan Clark who also wrote all the music that was used in this episode which was used with permission if you have questions comments or death threats you'll find all the contact info on the contact page at scathingatheist.com Oh, shit. Hold on. <laughs> he oh, there's blood. blood. He's just <laughs> vomiting blood. everywhere. Uh, there's a good deal of blood. There's a good oh, deal no. of blood. Toughen it up. That's why, have, that's why you have a pop filter. <laughs> <laughs>
to stop the blood. All right. <coughs> Sarah Huckabee Sanders wears a pop filter as a tampon. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2019. All rights reserved.